your Bibles, if you would. We're opening up a new book this evening, so turn with me to the book of Ezra. It's funny, we're doing Ezra. I thought, Ezra? you got to be kidding me. Micah should be teaching this class, right? Sheesh, Ezra, right? We've all been praying for Ezra because Micah gives us updates on Ezra. So little Ezra joke there. But Ezra, just all Ezra is, is really it's a continuation. We left off last week in the book of Second Chronicles with the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, going into captivity into Babylon. And so they, they rolled away. We're going to look at it here in just a second. They rolled into captivity. Um, and Ezra is the, uh, just another historic book in the Bible, taking account of now their coming out of captivity, and how powerfully led and orchestrated by God this coming out of captivity is in order to rebuild Jerusalem, but really primarily Ezra is to rebuild um, the, the temple uh, in Jerusalem and to begin to start worship once again. So it's just an interesting thing. They've been, they've been taken captive um, Here's a little note, just a tidbit. From the time of Saul all the way up until the time of Israel's captivity was 200 years. I mean, you, you read through the list of kings and of this king and that king, and you think, oh, thousands of years. Israel had only been a nation for 200 years before they fell into captivity. America's what, 244 years old? And so in Judah, the southern kingdom, they lasted a little bit longer because they honored God more and they had some more God-honoring kings in there, but they still only made it 320 years until they fell into captivity. That's just kind of a mind-blower. There's so much time in Egypt. Was, was it 400 years in Egypt? There was so much time in Egypt and then 40 years in the wilderness and then this conquering of, of the nations of Israel through the books of Judges and with the life of Joshua and, and how, how long that took. And then you finally, they get to set up as a kingdom. And I'm like, they're, they're ancient. They're thousands of years old. 200 years for Israel, 320 for Judah. And it just all that to say, it doesn't take a whole lot for a nation to fall. All it takes is turning from God and turning from the word of God and kicking God out of your nation. So, I mean, it's funny because I look at our nation and I'm thankful that we get to pray for it. It feels like it's teetering. Anybody feel that? Like, whoa, I'm not sure what's going to happen. We, we, we have a very vocal minority that wants things that are ungodly to be constituted and to be legislated and published and made as law. And we got a huge, in my opinion, I think it's a pretty big silent majority that's going, this is weird. And I, and I think we... As Christians, need to do everything we can, starting on our knees, which is, sometimes we forget this, the most powerful thing we could do is get God active in our nation. The most powerful thing. I mean, you could pick it, you could occupy, you could do a whole lot of other things, but prayer is the most important for us. And not only is it most important, it's a directive. Jesus said to pray. Paul said to pray for our nation, for those kings, those governors. So, anyways... It's just, uh, it, it's just one of those things where I look at it and go, man, it doesn't take long. It only takes the turning away. Now, the, I think the best thing we have going for our nation <clears throat> is unlike in a dictatorship where basically whatever the king says has to be law and is forced. In America, we still have some freedom and some rights for ourselves. You know, we could hear the government say, you should do this. And we can say, no, because I am we the people. I'm a free American, and one day that's going to be taken, I believe. I believe one day that's going to be taken, but while we have it, I encourage you, man, there used to be a brother that used to go to church here, and he would argue with me about voting. I'm like, you have got to vote. Are you kidding me? You know those people and all those other nations that have dictators wish they could vote them out, and they don't because they can't, and here you are going, it's not worth it. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Just do something. Anyways. I'm a little passionate about that. I think we need to do the very best we can. I know. People go, I don't like voting for the least of two evils. I don't either. You know? Tell Franklin Graham to run. I don't know. Something, right? 
But anyways, until, until then, until it's taken away, we've got to continue doing what we can do. We've got to continue praying for the Supreme Court. We've got to continue uh, just fighting for the freedoms that the founders... Um, man, I heard an amazing... I know I'm just going on rabbit trail after rabbit trail, but I heard an amazing uh, podcast today, uh, a conservative Christian guy, and he was talking about one of the biggest things that America has lost in, in the conservative side is honor. Honor is huge. And our nation's lost honor. Honor means when you talk to somebody, when you're having a relationship with somebody, you view them as valuable and as higher than yourself. And you relay that in the way that you communicate with respect. That's what honor is. And this guy was just saying, guys, and in churches, in Christian homes, honor is lost. And it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the case. And I'm like, man. Lord, thank you for that. I need to hear that. So let's check really quick. Uh, back up just a little bit to Second Chronicles. I'm going to flip over there. Whoop. Almost dropped my pen. Second Chronicles, uh, at the end of Second Chronicles, I'm just going to read just straight through, but listen to it. It's in uh, chapter 36, verse 15. I'm just going to read straight through to verse 21. And the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent warnings to them by his messengers rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and they despised his word and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. He sent warnings. He sent the word. They mocked it. And he basically kind of let that go on until there was nothing left for God to do but fulfill his word, which was to take them into captivity. Verse 17, therefore he brought against them, he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young men uh, or virgin, no compassion on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into this king's hand. Verse 18, and all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasuries of the house of the Lord, the treasuries of the king and of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. And then they burned the house of God and they broke down the wall of Jerusalem and they burnt all of its places with fire and destroyed its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon where they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths as long as she lay desolate. She kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Interesting. So we got a little bit more information about what's going on. Something I really wanted to note, though, was the, the major destruction of Jerusalem and the temple breaking down of the wall. And uh, one of the commentaries I went through, I think I remember going through this, it's been a while, but at the very end of Kings, um, the, the, the kings of Jerusalem would keep rebelling against Babylon. And, and they finally, it took three times for them to finally totally break Jerusalem and that city. And so the last time when they were headed out, uh, the king of the Babylon or whatever sent back a guy and said, I want you to completely destroy. I don't want to ever have to deal with these guys again. This is the third time we've been out here and it's cost so much. And so they completely destroyed the temple. And Ezra, again, like I said, it's just a continuation of the history as they come out of this captivity. This captivity it, it wasn't to eg exile Israel forever. It wasn't to cast them off. It wasn't for them. God's not saying, I'm done, I'm finished, and turning his back on Israel forever. That's really not God's goal ever in life. That's not his goal. His goal with this kind of severe correction is just that. It's correction. It's that, it's that they would learn that the word of God's true. It's that they would learn that when they give over to those demonic things, they're going to ruin their life, and God's just faithful to what he said he was. The whole reason for the correction was restoration. I mean, this is a book of restoration. <laughs> this is a book of God not only fulfilling his promise 
to take them captive and to take them out and to, to correct them, to chastise them. But he fulfills his promise to bring them back to the promised land. He didn't break his promise. It's a, it's a, a book of restoration. God is merciful. He's a God of second chances. When I think about this, and one of the commentaries said, look at this amazing second chance. I'm like, you, if you're counting chances that God gave them while they were in the land, you got to be kidding me. It's like the third, 300 and second chance that God's given them. But he still is for the people. Man, he still wants to... <laughs> you guys, we got to know this. God's heart is for you. He wants to to prosper you. He wants to bring restoration. He wants to just have you flourish primarily spiritually. A lot of times a whole lot of money gets us in trouble. Primarily spiritually, but he is for us. And sometimes we forget. And we go through something really hard. And we think, where are you at, God? But he's doing something because he's for you and he loves you and he wants to restore you. Okay, and we're going to get back into that a little bit, that thought a little bit later i got to keep moving or we're never going to get through. But so there's three phases of this rebuilding of Israel, of Judah, Jerusalem uh, mission. The first one is the first six chapters of Ezra. And it's the first phase. It's the rebuilding of the temple led by Zerubbabel. That's a name. You can't, you can't say that one five times fast. Zerubbabel. Phase two is led by Ezra, the author of the book here, um, and he, well, in phase one, there's some, it says there, we'll see at the end of the text, it's some 50,000 people that go with him uh, to rebuild the land. Phase two, Ezra comes with 2,000 people, and he comes to bring reinforcements to help the work. Uh, he brings some physical reinforcement, but the main goal of Ezra is spiritual reinforcement, is to get them back, their hearts on the Lord, their vision for what's going on a spiritual reform that Ezra brings. We're going to see that. And then Nehemiah is the third phase, and he comes along. Mainly, Nehemiah is concerned with the building of the wall and the enemies attacking and the guys working with you know, weapons and that kind of stuff, if you remember some of the book of Nehemiah. So that's what we're going to look at. Uh, this is the first part, first phase of that period. So let's just get into it. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to read Ezra 1 through... We're going to go through 4. So... Here we go. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying. And so he gives us, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. Here's his writing. All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem, and whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So right there, right at the beginning in verse 1, it says the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now really quickly, this is not the first year of Cyrus being a king, What's, what, the, what Ezra is portraying to us, what he's revealing to us, is it's the first year after he defeated Babylon, which made him the king over basically the, the known world. It made him the powerhouse of all of the ancient world to have Babylon. So um, Cyrus has become this king of Persia. He's become the, the world force, so to speak. Um, just taken over Babylon. Also in verse 1, we see that the Lord stirred up King Cyrus's heart, stirred up his spirit, it says. I was, uh, in, my, in our devotions a couple days ago with my kids, I was interchanging spirit and heart. And they're like, no, it said spirit. I'm like, well, it's the same thing, man. It's not talking about the ticker, the beating, pumping heart. It's talking about the heart, the spirit. 
But God stirred Cyrus's heart, this pagan king, to do a few things. Number one, to allow the release of the people of Israel. Number two, he stirred them to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem. And it says that he was commanding that it would happen. And number three, he was going to give provisions. He was going to provide provisions in order for this building project. And in that, he would fulfill the word. There it says, I think it's verse 1 still, yeah. It says, he fulfilled the word of the Lord by the prophet Jeremiah. So really quick, let's look at this, this prophecy in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, it's, it's Jeremiah 29. You guys are probably familiar with this book, with this chapter in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, specifically verse 10 in Jeremiah 29. And verse 10 says, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. And then it goes into the most famous part, right? For I know the thoughts that I have toward you. Thoughts for a hope and a future. Did I say this 26? What did I say? 29. You guys are scaring me. So God, I mean, the main thing, though, that is being relayed here is that God promised after 70 years, and they realized 70 years is up, and so at this same time, Cyrus takes over Babylon, and the ball starts rolling at the 70-year point for them to start going back. God's will is being, um, is being fulfilled. Also during this time, you're probably thinking of somebody else who was 70 years was clicking in their mind. Who was it? Daniel, absolutely. Daniel, he was, remember, he's one of the, one of the young men that were taken captive, but he was uh, like a nobleman, right? So he was put with um, Mishael and... Is it Ahijah? I only know him by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? So that's the pagan names given to him, which is, I feel, every time I can't remember their Hebrew names, I feel ashamed. So that's, that's where I'm at. Anyways, but Daniel was one of those guys, and now at this point, he's old, he's probably 80s, maybe 90s, um, and he's probably, from what we can gather from the book of Daniel, in his old age, he got drawn back out. Uh, into being a leader, and remember the guy was going to give him up to half his kingdom and all this stuff because Daniel would would was he was given the gift of prophecy and he was he would never take the credit he would always say God did this God is revealing this to you so anyways Daniel had he probably still unless he passed and it could have been that he passed we're not 100 percent sure unless he passed he was probably still in some leadership role but even if he passed we still have a great expectation from what we're going to look at here in just a minute, that one of the guys that he was training up, somebody talked to Cyrus. That's what we're going to, we're going to guesstimate here, that when he took over Babylon, I just picture Daniel, this old wrinkly dude with his cane out there with the Bible going, Cyrus, look at this. Now, we're going to get to that here in just a second. <clears throat> but this, 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 what I'm talking about, could have been one of the biggest reasons for the stirring of Cyrus's heart. In fact, the Jewish historian, because this is kind of all speculation until you, you get into Josephus's writings, and he alludes to this, that somehow someone that was trained in the ways of God showed King Cyrus some interesting scriptures, and the interesting scriptures are Isaiah 44. Grab your Bible, turn it over to Isaiah 44. Keep your finger in Ezra. <clears throat> Isaiah 44, we're going to start in verse 21, and we're going to read this. This would have blown his mind, because it blows my mind. I know my mind's probably more puny, but... <laughs> Mind blown. So, Isaiah 44, 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. 
Shout, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, you mountains. O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Thus says the Lord, you're a redeemer. And he who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things. Who stretches out the heavens all alone. Notice there, no help. Who spreads abroad the earth by myself. Who frustrates the signs of the babblers. And drives diviners mad, who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolishness, who confirms the word of his servant and performs the counsel of his messengers. Basically, there in verse 26, he's saying what the prophets say is because I'm telling them and I confirm it. You can see what happens in the lives of those prophecies. God, the only, the only um, God, of course, but the only ancient deity that we can look at that had this thing in his writings called prophecy, where he would speak things that would happen. Okay, so let's just, now that that's kind of cleared up, let's keep going. To the cities, verse 26, I'm sorry, who says to Jerusalem, verse 26, you shall be inhabited. To the cities of of Judah, you shall be built, and I will raise up her waste places. Who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord, chapter 45, verse 1, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasuries of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by name, am the God of Israel." For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have called you by your name. (laughs) Two times, Cyrus, I have called you by your name. Let me just give you a tidbit that I haven't given you yet. This was written 140 years before Cyrus was born. He says, I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no other God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. I just, how awesome. Cyrus... If Daniel walked out and showed him this ancient text, you think that would have stirred his heart? Let me just, let me give you something else really quickly. (laughs) History says, all the way back to, where is it? Verse 27, who says to the deep, be dry and I will dry up your rivers. History says that when he just, and he just took over Babylon, when he had taken over Babylon, he did something specific that he diverted the, the river that went into Babylon around Babylon so that the water would dry up. And he's reading this and he's like, I just did that. You know, whoa, this is crazy. And he's speaking of the victories that Cyrus would have and he's telling him, I did that, Cyrus. And you know Cyrus is thinking, whoa, it's just like we do in our life. Once we get saved and we realize what God's been doing and we can look back and see stuff and go, dude, God totally kept me. There was that one time. I should be dead right now. But I didn't go because my truck broke down and then, you know, the thing blew up or whatever. You, there's always those things. I think of Amir Sarfati, right? He was supposed to be in the Twin Towers and he didn't go that day. There's so many miracles like that. We can look back and go, God's seen it all. He's seen it all. He's been there through it all. And so I just, again, this just blows my mind. And it would seem by this decree that Cyrus wrote back in our text in Ezra 
that we just looked at, that Cyrus is now some sort of a believer in God. I mean, I don't know if he's really a real follower and he's trying to go worship the Lord and honor him in his whole life, but definitely he believes in the God of Israel. And I think this is what stirred his spirit to write this decree. So a couple of things really quick. First one is, let this be a reminder to us that God sees you. He is very familiar with your ways. I mean, he knows us. And that could kind of be one of two things. It could be, number one, scary if we're living in sin. Or number two, it can bring peace like crazy in the midst of trial to go, God is so familiar with me. He knows everything I'm going to do, and I want to keep walking in his path. He's there. He's seen it. I want to keep staying close to him. He's given me the choice. Sometimes that's hard for our brains. My brain explodes. I can't comprehend he sees my whole future, but he asks me to follow closely with him. And he gives us the choice. It's interesting. Number two, let this also be a reminder that no matter what our national situation is, God's in control. No matter what the reli- religious, the, the you know, um, po- political climate rulers, whoever is in office, God's in control. And so we can remember that. We can take hope in God and his word. So Cyrus, he makes this proclamation there in verse 2, and he just, he states a few things. He says there, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. <laughs> it's just, I go right back to Isaiah. God says, I gave you these. He just writes it. I acknowledge that. Yes, he did. And he's commanded me to build the house of Jerusalem, which is in Judah, what God told him to do. Verse 3, who among you of, of, is, who is among you, I'm sorry, of all his people? Who is, who's with you that's God's people? Who in my kingdom are God's people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. So he just gives them permission. He opens, they're in captivity. He basically opens all the doors and says, go. Do what God's told me you're supposed to do. Go for it. And so he calls them all to go and to get out there. And then he sort of gives a directive to the Jewish people who would be the ones to stay In verse 4, he says, And whoever's left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the freewill offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So he says, And you guys that are going to stay here and you're not going, help your guys out. Like fund the trip, fund the mission trip to go build the church. Sort of. Of course, I'm just kind of relating it to maybe our day and age. But, but help them by financing this mission. So it's interesting. A few thoughts that kind of come from this section of Scripture. The first one is, wait a second. You mean God opened the doors to deliver his people and not everybody went? That's the truth. The truth of the matter is a very small amount of people from the whole nation of Israel went. A small amount of people. And the rest of them stayed. Why? Oh my goodness, the draw of the world is why. And that's really what it is. Again, in Josephus, the, the historian, the records that he has of the history of the people of Israel, it says, he says that they stayed because they had houses and they had business and they had riches, they had wealth. And so they would rather stay in the world where they were comfortable than to go back to the place that God wanted them to be that God made for them to be, that God promised them, the place of the house of worship. They'd rather stay than go. I'm not going to, yeah, okay, I'm going to. So I'm going to say it, but no offense to anybody, anybody watching live on TV, but for a while there, COVID kind of had this effect. I'd rather stay than go. I'd rather stay than go. I don't want to go out. I want to stay. And, you know, and a lot of times <laughs> I remember hearing this pastor and I was like, whoa, I felt like I wanted to duck for him just in case somebody threw a cell phone or something, you know, 
But he was up at the pulpit, and he was just like, you know, and, and now this has caused kind of a, you know, the thing swept through, and it's caused kind of this laziness, and people are like, well, I'll just watch church at home because I'm going to go to the lake on Sunday instead of go to the house of the Lord. This can happen in our lives. This is something that we, we see here with the children of Israel. And I don't want to get too hard on them, and I don't want to beat up on them too much, because there was still a lot of people, as we're going to see, that funded this trip, and they were needed, they were necessary. But the big important thing, we're going to see in a minute, I'm blowing my notes up right now, but the biggest and most important thing is what is God calling you to do? It's not what everyone else is doing, not what's convenient. What's he calling you to do? Is he calling you to go? Is he calling you to stay? Is he calling you to support? Is he calling you to, you know, maybe you can't support, but you got a hammer. I don't know. It's, it's the same, same sort of thing here that, that we, we want to see. But this is just an interesting thing you know, that a bunch of them, m- the majority of them stayed there. And it's funny, I mean, because after their captivity, sometime after, we're not exactly sure, but basically they were just kind of allowed into the economy to live life, which is a little weird. You'd think they'd all be slaves, but anyways, this is what happened in Babylon, and it just, you know them, you know them Jewish people, man. They got after it. Started probably having doctors and lawyers. In fact, some of the commentary I went through was talking about that, doctors, lawyers, jewelers, because when they were over there, they weren't given any properties and land. Otherwise, what they normally did was they would be agrarian, and they'd have sheep and wool and all that kind of stuff, but because they didn't have land and they were like in a very populated area, they had to do something, so they started becoming educated and started uh, doing this kind of stuff, so, and history shows that. So, so the response. Before we get into the, the response of the people, because this is still the decree, we're looking at the decree, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention. Number one is this. This is historically recorded. This decree that Cyrus wrote is historically recorded on something called the Cylinder of Cyrus. So if you want to look up the Cylinder of Cyrus, there's this stone thing that's a big cylinder, and it's got stuff written all over it in that ancient language. It's, it's these decrees, and it's awesome. It's just this, this is, this, when it says it's a history book, it's a history book. And since Ezra is a historical document, it's fact in here. This is it make-believe. You know, one of, the, one of the guys that was going out on the, on the witnessing, the door-to-door stuff, well, that's all fairy tales and make-believe. Dude, I'm sorry to say this, you don't know. You, you have, you're just saying, you're parroting something you heard from somewhere else, you haven't researched it at all. This is history. This is, this is, this is where, I can't remember the name of that facility. What it? Smithsonian. Smithsonian Institute. It's like their number one book to find stuff. If it's in the Bible, they're going to have some kind of location about where it's at, right? I think of... Uh, which one of those old rich guys was it that got into oil because he, he read about the tar pits that were going on in, in the Tower of Babel? Who was it? Henry Ford? Rockefeller? All these people, man. They just they go, the Bible's real, and then they go find out that it is. Absolutely. So anyways, all that to say, if you want to look up the Cylinder of Cyrus, check it out. It's an interesting thing. But there's something that I want to go back to really quickly. Verse 4 Check this out. Not only did Cyrus tell them to go back and rebuild the temple, but he expected them to begin to worship the one true and living God because he said they're to offer offerings, which is interesting. I, I kind of wonder how much he got into Judaism and how much he started looking back to the old text. I wonder if he caught wind somehow and just thought, you know, you know a way to bless my nation? There was a promise to Abraham that those who bless you would be blessed and those who curse you would be cursed. And he sent them back and he said, I just want you guys to do something. I want you to get right with God and start worshiping. That's like what I want you to do. Go back, rebuild the stuff, make sure you worship God. Interesting. If if that was the case, that's cool. If it was just the case where he goes, he's a pagan uh, king, right? He goes, I need all the gods on my side I can get. (laughs) So you guys go, do it, which is horrible. (laughs) That's inaccurate. It's just something that they would have thought. Okay. Okay, verse 5. Here's the response to, here's the, the response for the, uh, the children of Israel to um, the decree. It says, Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all whose spirits God had moved 
I mean, underline that, circle it in the Bible of the person sitting to your left. All of those God had moved to arouse, I'm sorry, they arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, uh, with goods and livestock, and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. I am reading verses 5 and 6. Ezra, chapter 1. Okay. Missed it by a little. So Ezra 5 and 6. So this was his response to King Cyrus. God moved them. They got up. Verses 5 and 6. We have these two groups. We have the group of the of the religious people that are going, the, the priests and the Levites that are going. And then in verse 6, we have the people that were staying. And again, we see something that's interesting. Um, we see that both of these were called to do a couple of different things, but they were both willing to do what God had put on their heart to do. They were both willing to do. They, they needed the priests, they needed the leaders, but also... They needed those people that were just going to come. We saw that in verse 5. So, of course, they needed the priests and the Levites because they're going to build a temple. And if you build a temple, you need the people that are going to run the temple. Um, But did you notice there, and I told you, of course you noticed, I told you to underline, all whose spirits God had moved. And I just, God can do whatever he wants. I mean, he he could move you out of his own strength, but that's really not how God operates. Usually when God's stirring and moving in somebody's heart, it's because of a few things in that person's life. Usually it's because that person is wanting God, is seeking God, is putting time aside to listen, is doing things in their life to quiet the world so they can hear the Spirit of God. And I just, I think about this people whose spirits God had moved, and I just think, are we these people? I want to be this person. I want to be close to him. And in my mind, I think if we're not close to him, this is never going to happen. We have to be sensitive to God's call. We have to have hearts that desire his will. We have to have hearts that want his kingdom to be built. They want people to be saved. We have to desire his presence and for his presence to be here and and for any of these things to be done. I mean, it really starts with a willing person. It starts with us. Also, another thought that I had as I was thinking about this is that's the people that you want with you. I mean, when you're on the mission field, When you're walking through life and it's hard, you want the people whose hearts are stirred by God with you, close to you. You don't want people there that don't want to be there, you know? You don't want people there that are banging around pots in the kitchen, going, I got to cook another meal for the church, or whatever it is, right? You want people that have a heart that says, man, I just want to be where God's people are. I want to be doing what he wants to do. And if God's calling us to go over here, I'm going. If God's calling us to go down this street and knock on that door, I'm going because I don't want to miss what God's going to do. He could save somebody's life. I don't want to miss it. And so I'm just thinking, this is the kind of people that I want to be around, that we want to be around. Then there's group B. That's group A. Group B is also needed. The group that we saw there in verse 6, who would encourage them, not just with words. They didn't just go, man, guys, high fives on the way out. Get them. I mean, let me just tell you really quickly. This is going to be a very difficult journey. It's not like they're going to roll into Jerusalem and go over to the Home Depot and pick up a load of material. This is going to be very hard. It's going to be, it's, there's not going to be a lot of funding. And this, here, here are these people, they didn't just give them high fives. They really put their money where their mouth is, so to speak. They said, we want to see this happen. And we're going to give you gold and silver and sacrifices and flocks. We're going to prepare you so that you can go, you can eat some food, you can have some way to be introduced back into the land. Not, now, the land isn't completely vacant. 
There's mixed groups of people that are there. There's some Israelites that are still there. In fact, that's kind of where Samaria, uh, the Samaritans happen in that region because the, the foreign people with the Jews that are kind of, you know, later on in Jesus' day, they're like the worst of the worst. They're like the half-breeds that nobody likes, and it's all racist and all this stuff. And it's real, real racism. <laughs> Anyways, I'm sorry. No, I don't want to go off. Different things. Stay to the word. But it's just one of these things where... You, 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 they, were, they were going back there and facing huge obstacles. And not only were they encouraged, they were also supported as they went out, which is so important. But again, and back to the, the main thing, the most important thing for us is to do what God is calling us to do. If God's calling you to give, if God's calling you to just go serve, if God's calling you to watch the two-year-olds, the 1.5-year-olds, we didn't have we didn't have childcare um, last night, and we had an unexpected 1.5 year old in there, and I forgot about 1.5 year olds because I don't have one anymore, and I forgot. I thought I know what this kid is going to want to color. 1.5 year old he didn't know how to pick up anything really. I mean, except when he puts it in his mouth. So he's just. I opened up the colored pencils, and all he wanted to do was put his hand in there and just grab him and let him go and just. And I'm just like, man, just so you guys know, we need people that can do that too. I mean, just sit with the kid and have fun and tell him stories about Jesus that he doesn't understand. I go, man, Jesus loves you. And he goes, it's really cute. You want to sit down? But he understood because he went and sat down. It was great. So anyways, also... I know this is just neither here nor there. I built a really cool Lincoln log cabin. <laughs> and he just loved to smash it and hear them all go ting, 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 all around the place. So I did that three times, and then I gave up. I'm like, okay, that's it. So anyways, whatever it is that God is calling you to do, I mean, just be willing, whatever it is. Uh, and man, Lord, I pray that you stir our hearts. Pretty through our hearts. All right, let's finish up this chapter. We only got a few more verses. Next, we see some more of the provision that God makes through King Cyrus. Look, look at this in verse 7. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of this one guy, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Sheesh Bazaar. Probably not pronounced quite like that. The prince of Judah. And the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, and 1,000 other articles, unnamed articles. Verse 11, all the articles of gold and silver were 5,400, and all these she's bizarre, took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. All right, let's try it right. Shezbazer, okay? Let's do it like that. Shezbazer, okay. So they, 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 this, is, this is amazing. This, to me, this, again, is another mind blower, all right? It just, we just looked at this back in... Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 18. Could you imagine being there in Jerusalem and having any semblance of loving God, of wanting God, and watch all of the gold and silver from the temple, all the gold just be taken and just marched out of there and just hopeless, just like, man, they've taken everything that's important to me and to worshiping God and valuable, and God kept it aside. And so when you come back, I'm going to give you all of it back. How crazy is the mercy of God? How amazing is the mercy of God? He really is the one that restores all that the canker worm has eaten, right? He's really the one that wants to bless more. But, but he wants us to learn the lessons in life. He wants us to grow. He wants us to learn to trust him. And I look at this and I just, God, you are so faithful. Oh, it's one of those places where you finally turn around 
to follow God, and you feel like you're way out, and you are way out in the left field, but when you turn around, you realize he's just right there, <laughs> just right there to meet you and walk you back and to, and to begin to restore. Man, just how awesome. Now, really quickly, she's bizarre. This guy is probably Zerubbabel. There's a, there's a lot of scholars that believe Zerubbabel and Shezbazar are the same person, and the Shezbazar is a title, a Babylonian title, and um, that Zeb, Zerubbabel is, is his Jewish name. One of the commentaries said, this is interesting, it's a little note, Shezbazar means joy in affliction, and Zerubbabel means stranger in Babylon, which is interesting. You look at that and you think, That'd be kind of neat if those were both his name and this one guy. And joy and affliction, but a stranger in Babylon. And I, I look at that, I think about that, and I go, that, sh that should be us in the world. Even though we're afflicted, even though we're not home yet, we should have joy and affliction. Because we have Christ. And we have the answer. I got a new bumper sticker. It says, Jesus is the answer. That's all it says. It's true. And then, the other side of it, stranger in Babylon. We shouldn't be too comfortable here. We should be pilgrims. This is not my home. You know, the address of my house, that's not my home. That's not permanent home. That's temporary home. Permanent home is in heaven. Permanent home is that home whose builder and maker, he didn't do it with hands. He spoke it. And it's going to be good to be there. But while we're here, joy and affliction. And remember, this isn't it. we got so much more to look forward to. Amen? Let's all stand together. As we get into Ezra, I was supposed to go through chapter 2. Didn't make it. That's all right. Lord, we thank you this evening for your word. God, we thank you for the prophetic power of your word. Just to look at that again and say, whoa, God, you, you know. You know. And thank you for reminding us that you see and that you hear and that you know what's going on in our lives and in our nation. And at the same time, you know what's going on in Israel right now, this moment. And you know what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. God, you see. And we can trust you. Lord, help us to continue to trust you and walk. I thank you that you're the God of restoration. I thank you that you're the God who, man, you're, you're just merciful, God. Lord, and even in the discipline in life, even in the hard things, we can look at that and say, it's really, we know one thing, it's, not, it's, it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance, to the saving knowledge of Jesus. We thank you for your heart, for your faithfulness, Lord. God, fill us up. We want to be those that are sensitive to your stirring and that hear your voice. So Holy Spirit, we, right now, we, we welcome you to fall on us now and to, and to fill us to overflowing, to baptize us for this life, for this walk that we have, for this pilgrimage. As we are on this journey and we have an orchestrator that can direct our steps, God, we want to be used by you. We don't want to miss stuff. So help us to be close and open, and we thank you again for your word in this time, and I thank you for these crazy Christians that would come out and sit and hear your word in the middle of the week. Bless them, God. Move in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.